it's actually, yeah, it's not going to be the whole lecture on the Susie algebra. But this is, this, is, um, this is where we got to last time. OK, so last time what we had done is we had uh, worked out supersymmetry transformations in free field theory and then uh, worked out the Noether current, the Noether, the Noether charges. And we had got to this point here where we had, let me use the, get the pointer, <clears throat> where we would, uh, we had found the, uh, the famous uh, n equals 1 supersymmetry uh, algebra, okay? And as I commented, this, is, uh, this shows again, really shows that this is a space-time transformation because the, essentially the square of a SUSY generator is a space-time translation, okay? So I'm going to stop writing. We've been using hats for operators. I'm going to stop doing that now. So now let's look at some general consequences of this supersymmetry algebra. So not assuming anything of, of, about the theory other than the fact that it has this symmetry, OK? So now you can sort of invert the supersymmetry algebra by projecting out uh, the, the, the momentum generator. I guess I didn't drop the hats yet. Anyway, I'll drop them soon enough. And so basically, the, the zero, uh, P0, which is the Hamiltonian, can actually be written uh, essentially as a sum of squares. And so we can see that the energy of any state in a supersymmetric theory uh, must be greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, the, uh, if the vacuum is supersymmetry invariant, right, we expect in general that the vacuum state should be invariant under all space-time symmetries, then what we see is that the actually four momentum of the whole state vanishes, in particular the energy vanishes. Okay, so unlike uh, non-supersymmetric theories, because the Hamiltonian is the square of some a symmetry generator, right? Then the invariance actually uh, makes it natural for the vacuum energy to vanish, and this seems like this could be a very important clue for the cosmological constant problem. Although to make that precise, we would have to dis uh, discuss supergravity. Okay, so the other consequence, general consequence, I want to talk about. Uh, before we talk about real theories, is just what kinds of particle representations are allowed by supersymmetry. When we have, uh, we know that when we have uh, a Lorentz invariance or Poincaré invariance, the one particle states are described by a momentum and a spin, right? So we have a three momentum and a spin, and that describes all single particle states. Now, for massless uh, states, the spin is just a helicity, the projection of the spin along the momentum. And the way we analyze these in supersymmetry is the same way that we do in field theory. We choose for each particle, massless particle, we can choose a frame where the momentum takes this form. And then in that frame, the SUSY algebra looks like this. And so what we see is that Q1 is, uh, acts trivially, and Q2 act like raising and lowering operators, like fermionic raising and lowering operators, OK? And so uh, what we can do is we can see that actually by looking at the commutation relations with spin, we can see that Q2 and Q2 dagger raise and lower the spin, okay? But because they are fermionic operators, you can only act once with the raising operator before you get zero. And so what you find is that the massless, uh, the massless uh, single particle representations, uh, for, there's one where the ground state of the, lo the lowest spin state has, uh, has uh, spin zero, and then there's, uh, by acting with Q2, we can create a, a, a spin one-half state, or we can start with a spin one-half state as the lowest spin state and get a spin one state, okay? Of course, we can write down fermion multiples with any spin, but these are the only ones that we can write renormalizable theories for, okay? So in a very simple and direct way, the supersymmetry algebra tells us what kinds of particle multiplets we should expect. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. okay. So now we're going to go into super space, right? This is the part in the science fiction film where like this, okay? And uh, uh, I, I actually debated with myself some time about whether to uh, introduce this sub topic because it is a little bit technical, but I think it's worth it. After all, as uh, uh, we saw from Sabir's talk, really, uh, we human beings and 
we physicists in particular are explorers of space and time. And this subject is just uh, too beautiful and gives too much insight, I think, into the whole subject of supersymmetry uh, to omit it. So we're going to go into it. So things are going to get a bit more technical now, but that's it. This is a technical subject. So uh, I'm going to be going over things. Um, well, I, a good reference for what I'm going to be talking about here is, is, is given here. It uses almost the same conventions as me, with some very simple changes. So that's, that's good. Okay? And I think mine are more standard, by the way. So this doesn't violate my, my rule. OK, so let's, uh, let's remember what, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, 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 let's remind ourselves, what's the role of space-time in quantum field theory? Well, uh, obviously, Lorentz invariance acts on space-time, right? It acts linearly on space-time. And so that, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's important, right? OK, now the claim is that this, there's a space that supersymmetry acts on naturally, which is a generalization of space and time, which is called superspace. And this is, in addition to the space-time coordinates, we have one vial fermion and its complex conjugate, okay, which are additional fermionic coordinates. And the fact that they're anti-commuting coordinates, it just means they all anti-commute with each other and they commute with x mu, like this, okay. And just as for a quantum field theory, the natural variables are functions of space-time, those are the dynamical variables, the dynamical variables in supersymmetry, the natural ones, are going to be functions of this superspace. Now, these are called superfields. And what do they mean? What does it mean to be a function of an anti-commuting quantity, like these theta coordinates? Well, one way you can define a function is just by Taylor expanding it. So we can define functions of theta and theta bar by Taylor expansion. And Taylor expansion is very simple because these coordinates anti-commute, so their square is zero, so the, 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 the expansion terminates after a finite number of terms. So if we had a single theta, there would just be two terms in the Taylor expansion of a function. In the case of the superfields that we have, we have two thetas and two theta bars, so the highest component we can have has four thetas, okay? So we have only up to fourth order an expansion. And because of the, uh, the, the, the symmetries here, terms with two thetas can always be written in terms of contractions of the thetas, right, with our, with our trusty vial spinner indices that we learned about last time. And so if you look at a general superfield, okay, it, uh, it, it has a lowest component, an order theta term. It has theta squared terms, which we can write like this. It has theta cubed terms and theta to the fourth terms. That's what it is, okay? So one way we can think about theta and theta bar is that they're just some sort of placeholders. We can think of this superfield S as a kind of vector that contains all these different components. But notice that very non-trivially, these different components have different uh, spins, right? We have, let's see, uh, oops, I forgot a very important term. Uh, who wrote these slides? Um, there's a term that I forgot, which should be up there in the middle, which looks like this. Okay, that's very important. Okay, and this a mu should also be in that list of components. Okay, so obviously we're going to want, okay, so that should be, it's missing up, up, up in here. Okay, so uh, this thing has, this thing contains spinner fields, scalar fields, and vector fields, all mixed together. Okay. So there, you can, okay, all right. So now, uh, and it, you might not like anti-commuting coordinates, right? Just like mathematicians of the 19th century, a lot of them did not like the square root of minus one, i. What is that? What kind of number is that? And if you want to be, if you don't, if you're a conservative and you don't like i, you can always say that a complex number is just a pair of real numbers and you can define addition and, and, and multiplication of these things in this way. But nobody in their right mind would actually do complex uh, analysis in this way. It's very useful to have I as an organizing principle. In the same way, theta, it's a fictitious mathematical object if you like, but the more you get used to it, the more real it becomes, the more you know, actual it becomes, okay? And so in the same way, uh, just like I is a great organizing principle to understand, for example, how, where does this weird multiplication rule come from, uh, 
you can just multiply these, you can add and just multiply these superfield together and just expand the result and you get a new superfield. So there's a way of combining superfields in analogy the way there is of combining complex numbers. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, I haven't, the whole point of this is that supersymmetry is going to act on these superfield operators. So let's remember how uh, translations, which is part of the supersymmetry algebra, act on ordinary functions of space time. Um, oh, that slide guy screwed up again. There's supposed to be a phi of x here. This e to the i p a mu p mu is supposed to act on a phi of x right here. Okay, so uh, space-time translations act by guess what translations, and those are generated by uh, uh, a, 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 a derivative operator p mu, which is i d mu, right? Okay, and in the same way, what we're going to show is that supersymmetry transformations are generated by derivative operators acting on superfields. Okay, now the transformation parameter, as we've actually already seen, the, the transformation parameter of supersymmetry has got to be an anti-commuting number as well, okay? Stop me if there are questions. Otherwise, we're going to keep going. Okay, so what are these derivative operators? These derivative operators now act on superspace. So in addition to the ordinary space-time derivative, I can have derivatives with respect to the anti-commuting coordinates. Okay, and you can uh, you can uh, understand the rules for uh, for for taking derivatives using anti-commuting quantities using these basic relations that just say ah oh, this slide guy uh, so there should be some the appropriate bar thingy here okay so uh, I don't know what this is supposed to be but this one's right. These are the only two that are right, okay? I'll fix these. So let's look at the ones that are right. So they are, uh, they just tell me that if I take the derivative of the coordinate, I just get one if I use the same coordinate or zero if I use a different coordinate. That's what I'm trying to write here, okay? This was made while I was still jet lagged. I'm no longer jet lagged, so no more excuses. I'll actually try to answer your questions, okay? All right, so, and then you have to be careful about signs. You have to be careful about the fact that any two fermions that you move past each other, there's always a minus sign, and so that gives you some funny minus signs. Like, if you're taking this ordinary derivative, this theta hits this theta, but because you have to move it to the left first, you actually get a minus sign like this. With those two rules, you can work out any, uh, any derivative, uh, any theta derivative. Okay, and because the metric, the quote unquote metric, epsilon alpha beta is anti-symmetric, there are some additional signs coming from that, and you can work out, for example, this thing right here, which is, uh, which is a little bit, there's an extra minus sign compared to the way we usually raise and lower spinners. Okay, now I can just, with that technology, okay, obviously, by the way, if you want to learn any of this, you have to practice it yourself. I'm not going to do calculations in front of you. There's no time for that. But I am hopefully going to give you enough uh, information that you can do them, start doing this yourself and really make the subject your own. So um, now I'll tell you what the SUSY generators are. They are a linear combination of theta derivatives and uh, ordinary derivatives. Okay, and now that you, with this definition, you can just work out what the algebra is, and you find that it obeys this algebra right here, which is the SUSY algebra, if I remember that I d mu is p mu acting on uh, fields or superfields. Okay. All right. Okay, so superfields do give you a simple representation of supersymmetry. Okay. Now, just like whenever you have a symmetry, right, in, in field theory, you uh, often find that you need to redefine your derivative operators to be covariant under that symmetry. For example, if you have a gauge symmetry, you have to define covariant derivatives to get so that the derivatives of things transform simply under gauge transformations. The same thing happens in supersymmetry. If, uh, if I have a superfield, I can ask, do derivatives of that superfield also transform in the same way? Do they transform according to Q and Q bar under supersymmetry? And for the ordinary derivative, that is the case. Okay, d mu of a superfield is a superfield. That is, it transforms like a superfield. And to see that, we just check 
that if I take the transformation, I have to take d mu of the transformed thing, then the q is inside the derivative, but I can just, this derivative doesn't act on q or xi because they're independent of x, and so I can just pull the derivative through, right? And so d mu of a superfield is a superfield. Um, and formally, what this is, is this is saying that the derivative, the ordinary derivative, which is a derivative operator, commutes with q. Okay? And that's actually obvious. That's because d mu is basically just the momentum. And the momentum is supposed to compute with, commute with q. So yeah, it's, it's all, all consistent. Right? On the other hand, if I look, like, if I look at d by d theta of uh, acting on a superfield, that thing does not anti-commute with q. Okay? And that's simply because the definition of q, or rather q bar, involves theta. Right? So the definition of q involves theta and theta bar. So they don't anti-commute. Okay? But we can define covariant derivatives. Okay? And here they are. Here are the SUSY covariant derivatives. Notice that the formulas look very similar to the q's, but there's an important change of sign here. So they're not the same as the q's. Right? But they're, they're a little bit different. And then these things are constructed so that they anti-commute with all the q's and q bars. Among themselves, they obey actually the SUSY algebra again. Okay? Sort of conservation of ideas. Uh, the, only, the, al the algebra, only algebra in town is the, is the SUSY algebra. Okay? Questions? Okay? So this means that if I, I can take covariant derivatives of a superfield and get a superfield, okay? So a covariant because, again, I have the same sort of computation. If I want to find the very, the, how the uh, d alpha of s transforms, it's this. But now d alpha anti-commutes with q. So I get a plus sign here. That's not a typo. The, 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 the slide guy was paying attention here because uh, d alpha actually also anti-commutes with xi. Right? It's also an anti-commuting thing. All right? So it actually just like this. But anyway, um, and I just find that, uh, oops, OK, here I tried to explain it. So the point is, is that this thing transforms like a superfield. OK? We're good. All right? Any questions? OK. Now, an unusual feature of uh, 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 superfields is that the, the superfield that I wrote down for you, the most general superfield that I wrote down for you, is not actually an irreducible uh, representation. There are smaller representations, just like when we started with the Dirac representation, we could reduce it to the Weyl representation. Uh, this general superfield contains within it simpler superfields that transform into themselves under supersymmetry. And the simplest one is called the chiral superfield. And it is defined by imposing the condition that the uh, anti uh, SUSY covariant derivative, d bar, acting on the field, vanishes. Okay? Now, if this covariant derivative were an ordinary derivative, this would say that this. Uh, superfield phi is independent of something, right? If I say that d mu of phi is zero, it means it's independent of x. So th does this mean something like that? Uh, in fact, it does, OK? And you, but you have to, because this is a covariant derivative and not an ordinary derivative, you, can, you have to change variables to find what variable it's independent of. So we can change variables in superspace by just shifting the x coordinate by this theta dependent thing, OK? Um, and um, something I didn't, I should have, I should have uh, mentioned before. This theta, these thetas have units of the square root of a length. Okay, and I could actually see that if I go back to the SUSY algebra here. If I go back to the SUSY algebra, uh, I have to assign the units here consistently, right? D by, this is d by dx that has units minus 1. So the units that I have to assign to, uh, to, to theta are the square root of a length. Okay, so that's not, that's not something I get to make up, right? So if I come back to here, where are we? Okay, come back to here, this shift has units of length, so everything's good. Okay, I'm not introducing any new dimensional parameters. Okay, 
And now, with this shift, I can work out what d and d bar are in terms of the new variables, and I did it here. Now that you've absorbed that, I will tell you the answer. As I said, I'm not going to spend time on, uh, on doing calculations, but they're provided so that you can look, um, the notes will be posted, and you can use these to sort of get some practice doing these calculations, okay? But the point is, is that, uh, 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 sorry, I'll reveal it just for a second. The basic idea is just the chain rule, okay? There's nothing fancy going on here. I'm just, for example, for d bar, I have to use the chain rule, and I find that things cancel for d bar, but they add for d, okay? That's, that's, that's the basic idea, okay? And so what you find is that d bar in these coordinates is just d by d theta bar. Okay, and d has got this extra term in it. So this condition that d bar of phi is zero tells me that it is, it is independent of theta bar in these shifted, in these new coordinates, okay? And that means that I have a lot, when I ex tailor, do my Taylor expansion in theta in those coordinates, I only have three terms, which I write like this, okay? So this chiral superfield has a much smaller set of fields, okay? And if you don't know that we know what this thing looks like, these are called, this, this y, by the way, is called the chiral representation. These coordinates, y, theta, theta bar, are the chiral representation of superspace. Uh, if I don't like that, I can always expand these functions of y in terms of x and theta bar, right? I can just expand this out to figure out the relation between this and what I wrote down before. Okay? Questions? Okay. I'm either... Uh, pounding you into submission, or I'm much clearer than I think I am. Okay, so, um, and now some very basic things about chiral superfields. If I have any power of a chiral superfield, uh, it's, it's uh, d bar on that vanishes, so that's a chiral superfield, right? Uh, in fact, any function of phi, any function of phi at all, if I take d bar of it, it's a chiral superfield. Um, but notice that it's very important that this function, what I'm calling f of phi, is a function of phi and not a phi dagger, right? That is, f has to be a holomorphic function, right? So for a physicist, holomorphic is the same as analytic. I always forget what the distinction is for mathematicians. It has to do with singularities. But basically, uh, it's a function of, uh, of phi and not phi dagger. Okay? Now, this is actually extremely important. We'll see that this has a lot of far-reaching implications. The fact that chiral uh, supermultiplets have uh, a holomorphic structure is at the root of many of the beautiful and important properties of supersymmetry. So phi dagger uh, uh, it does not, is not a chiral multiplet, as you can easily see from the components, but it is an anti-chiral multiplet. Just by complex conjugation, d alpha of phi dagger is zero, and that's called an anti-chiral multiplet. So obviously, we can learn all about anti-chiral multiplets by just complex conjugating the results for chiral uh, multiplets, chiral superfields. Okay. okay. Now... Here comes another uh, somewhat technical point, but it's, 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 it's useful, okay? Um, and that is that uh, we now would like to define the uh, components, okay, of, uh, of, a, of a superfield. Now, one way to do that is just the way that we've done it so far, just do the Taylor expansion uh, in terms of theta and theta bar, right? The Taylor expansion in terms of theta and theta bar is, uh, is, 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 how, is the equivalent to doing a Taylor expansion using the derivative operator d by d theta, right? But we've seen that d by d theta is not a covariant object. The d alphas and d alpha bars are covariant objects. So it turns out to be useful to do the Taylor expansion in terms of the capital Ds and capital D bars. Okay, so basically we define the lowest component theta to be the uh, just the, the setting theta and theta, the lowest component phi of the super of the chiral supermultiple big phi by just setting theta and theta bar equal to zero. We denote that by just putting a slash at the end of it, a vertical slash. Okay, and now the the the, the fermion component is um, is equal to to d by d theta of this, which is just uh, uh, 
actually in this case just equal to the covariant derivative, and the same thing for the f component. So we can, we can write, so this actually agrees with the previous uh, definition for chiral superfields. It's actually uh, generalized for other kinds of superfields. We'll see that it actually is a little different than the d by d theta expansion. Here they, the, the two things coincide because the extra terms you can easily see vanish when theta equals theta bar equals zero. And now the point is, the point about this formulation is it makes it very easy to work out the SUSY transformations of these guys because we can just use the fact that the D's anti-commute with the Q's. So for example, if we want to know what is Q acting on phi, what we can do is we can use the fact that um, the, the Q's are equal to the D's up to the additional theta terms, and then we just get this for the lowest component. Okay, that's, that's pretty easy. So the lowest component phi transforms into zeta times psi. Notice that differs from what we had before by, but for when we did it before by a factor of one over root two, and that's because there's this factor of square root two that we, we wrote down in the definition of the, 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 the super, uh, super charge. Thank you. Okay? So it's all consistent. So you can get a better feeling for, for, for what happens if we look at the fermion case. We write Q of d alpha phi evaluated at theta equals zero. Now we can anti-commute without any cost the d through the Qs, right, which gives me a plus sign because of the size. Now I can replace the d's by the q's by the d's because the extra term vanishes when theta equals zero. And then I can just do some a little bit of algebra and I can get this. Okay? Now, if you go back to what we had before, there's again these silly, these factors of root two, which are because of standard conventions. There's this additional term involving f. f wasn't there before. We'll understand the role of f in a bit. Right now, it's just there, and we'll, we'll understand what it's doing there in a little bit. And in a similar way, you can work out the transformation rule for f. So you can use these superfields to find out how the component fields transform. Okay? Questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, the question is, uh, please remind what are these components? What am I talking about? Okay, so um, for a general superfield, here it is. A general superfield is a function of theta and theta bar, okay? And if I expand it out, I get all these different components, including the one that I forgot, okay? And these fields, A of X, Psi of X, and so on, these are called the component fields. So the analogy is that you can think of this, uh, the superfield has as its component fields all these fields here. Does that answer the question? What's the difference? Well, we're working that out. We're in the process of working that out. We're like, this is like when you first learned about complex analysis. I'm just teaching you what the complex numbers are. We're going to be working out the properties of these things. We're going to be writing quantum field theories in terms of them. That's what we're going to be doing. Okay. All right. So, I mean, in my, my opinion, you can do, you can do uh, uh, supersymmetry just by writing out lists of these fields and writing down the SUSY transformation properties like the ones that we've just derived. Um, by the way, you'll notice that I, I now have, uh, I have numbered slides now, so I'm trying to make it easier for you guys to uh, ask me questions. Um, so, we, here are the definitions of the component fields in terms of the superfield. Okay, that I'm using, and here are their supersymmetry transformation properties. Now, we could just work directly with these and check invariance under supersymmetry, but that would be sort of like the way Maxwell did electrodynamics. He didn't use vector notation, and he had, you know, he had E1, E2, and E3, and B1, B2, and B3. You know, that's a horrible mess, right? It's much better to use vector notation. In the same way, it's much better to organize these, uh, super, these fields phi, psi, and f into a superfield. That's the idea. Other questions? Yeah, please. That's correct. So I, the, the, the question is, do I, I do not assign uh, reality conditions to the uh, anti-commuting coordinates. Uh, X, of course, is real. X mu is the same X mu that you grew up with uh, in, in, in kindergarten. Uh, thetas are vile fermions. They are complex objects. Okay? The superfield, when I wrote down the general superfield, I did not impose any reality condition on it either. So the component fields are complex in general for that as well. 
Okay. Now this phi here, I also did not, my capital phi, I did not impose any reality conditions. So this phi is a complex scalar. This psi is a complex vial fermion, and this F is a complex scalar. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Now I have a theory with two scalars and a fermion, okay? And I now have the technology to write down interacting in SUSY invariant quantum field theories. This is a very, very big deal, right? Okay? So I want to understand if I have a superfield like phi, how do I write down invariance for that, right? Just like with ordinary field theory, I know how to write down invariance. I want to write down an invariant action. I integrate over all space time and I contract all the indices, right? That's how you do it. I want to know what the procedure is for uh, superfields, and it's actually not so different, it turns out, okay? So the claim is there are two kinds of supersymmetry invariants that I can write down. The first kind is like this. Uh, I can use, I'm again using these covariant derivatives. I'm going to be using them a lot, okay? I can take, uh, I can take as many covariant derivatives as possible of a superfield K, and I claim when I do that, I get something that is invariant under supersymmetry, or more precisely, transforms under supersymmetry to a total derivative. So it's a good enough for, to be a, and it gives me an invariant action, right? Okay, so here we're using the shorthand. When I square something like D, I mean contracting two Ds together, okay? And since I want this Lagrangian right here to be Hermitian, again, up to total derivatives, I need this K, this superfield, to be real. So here I am imposing a reality condition on this superfield. So K is a general superfield, except for it needs to satisfy this reality condition. Okay? Now, in, in, in supersymmetry, uh, as you'll see, about half of the symbols in supersymmetry are some form of the letter D. Right? There's D mu, there's capital D, and there's even more to come, okay? And here's an example, which is that this thing right here is called a D term, not as you might expect because it has D derivatives, but because this thing is equal to the highest component of the superfield K, which is also called D, okay? And I'm just not gonna apologize for this because you, you gotta learn this. Everybody in supersymmetry uses this, so you have to learn this horrible notation if you're gonna look at anything in the subject, uh, look at any papers in the subject, okay? All right, but anyway, this is, is it clear what this thing is? That's the most important thing. Yes? Okay? So now let's understand why is this thing, how, why does this thing transform into a total derivative? Well, I just do what I said before for the components. I just, now that I've, I have this technology, I'm just using the same trick over and over again. I, I write the transformation, I can pull the Q's out from the D's because of the anti-commutator, I can replace the Q's by D's, and then I can use the D algebra to show that this thing right here is a total derivative. Okay, and the basic reason is that if I look at, if I look at D acting on D, this thing here, there are three Ds next to each other and three Ds next to each other have to vanish because D anti-commutes with itself. A D bar next is not right next to the two D bars, but I can put it next to each other with a commutator and that commutator is a derivative. So consequences of the algebra for Ds are relations like this that give you commutation relations for the Ds and the D bars. Okay? All right? Any questions on this? Okay? So that's one kind of term we can write. Okay? If I have any superfield K, as long as it is real, I can write an invariant. There's another kind of invariant I can write, which is a similar idea, but if I have a superfield which is called W, okay, which I call W, that's the conventional name, then I can just take two D derivatives of it and get a, a supersymmetry invariant, okay? And since W is chiral, it's not real, so I have to add the Hermitian conjugate if I want to get a real Lagrangian. And the, the proof is the same kind of thing that I talked about before, okay? Um, all right? And I guess something I should, have, I should mention before too, if I want this Lagrangian to have dimension four, this W, this superfield has to have dimension three. If I go back here, did I mention it here? Um, 
yeah, I, I didn't say it, but this k right here has to have dimension two if I want the Lagrangian to have dimension four. Okay. Is there another typo? Which? Oh, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there shouldn't be a theta bar squared here. I'm sorry, because the highest component of the chiral superfield is uh, just the theta squared term in the chiral representation. Okay? So, sorry. Yeah, that slide guy again. Okay? I'll, but but I, I really appreciate you pointing out these typos. I will fix them all in the posted version. The, po the posted version for the first part of the notes, I tried to fix all the typos, so if you find some more, please send me an email. Okay? Or just talk to me. Okay. Um, now, in the literature, we don't, you don't usually find the notation that I've been using. You don't find that you write things in terms of d's and d bar squareds. Instead, the d term is written as an integral over all of superspace, and the f terms are written in terms of the integral over half of superspace. Now, you might think, what could be more different than integration and differentiation? They're usually inverses of each other. But actually, for anti-commuting coordinates, they're actually the same thing. Okay, if I have a single anti-commuting coordinate, the integral is, is the, the, a function just has a, a simple Taylor expansion here, and the integral is b, and that's the same thing as the derivative. Okay? Um, and so uh, this is why the, this notation is not crazy. Okay, so but rather than developing the theory of integration over superfields, I'm just going to define d4 theta to be this and d2 theta to be that. They're, they're, they are the same thing after you do the whole theory, so let's just, okay, let's just use that. But I will use this notation because I like it and it's what people normally use in this subject. I'll use the, the integration notation. Okay, questions? Okay. Okay, now we're ready. Okay, we're ready to start being field theorists instead of mathematicians. So we have, a, let's say we have one of these chiral superfields. Okay, it has these, these component fields. Okay, and let's say that, remember before we, uh, we wrote a free theory involving a complex scalar and a vial fermion. Let's suppose we want to do something, an interacting theory like that, try to make an interacting theory like that out of this chiral superfield. Then we want the scalar field to have dimension one, right? Well, that works because now the fermion field has dimension three halves and F has dimension two. We still don't know what F is, but we'll get there, okay? But at least the scalar field and the fermion field have the right dimensions. And so that means that the whole superfield has dimension one, right? Has the same dimension as its lowest component, okay? And now we can just use these tools that we have to write down the most general uh, Susy invariant Lagrangian. And for simplicity, I'm going to take the case where we have only dimensionless couplings. Let's suppose we're interested in that case. Then we can write d4 theta, which was really d squared d bar squared, remember. Uh, and we need to make something that is a real superfield and has dimension 2. Well, the unique thing we can write down is phi dagger phi, right? Okay. And for the, the, the superfield, we need something that has dimension three. So if we don't want to introduce any dimensionful couplings, we can just write phi cubed. And I've chosen the coefficient of phi dagger phi to be one just by rescaling the fields. So there's only one parameter in this theory, lambda. So you can remember these. So anyway, the, the dimensions of these integrals are two and one, which looks wrong because theta has dimension minus one. But remember, integration is the same as differentiation. <laughs> okay. All right? Now, OK, so here's the Lagrangian. Great. OK? But to do physics with this, what we need is we need to know what this looks like in terms of the component fields, phi, psi, and f, right? That's what we need to know. So, but we have the technology to do that now. Uh, we just uh, expose this integral for what it is. It's really differentiation. And then we use, guess what, the chain rule, right? We just have a whole bunch of derivatives acting on this thing. We just have to use the chain rule, okay? We have to be careful to use the right SUSY algebra, okay? And let's see, do I want to say anything about this? Well, yeah. No, I don't, I don't think I'm, you know, you get, what do you get? You get terms with four derivatives acting on this with three and one and 
this, and you use some algebra, and you get brrrr, there's what you get. Now this is pretty cool. This is, in fact, very cool, because what I see is I have an ordinary kinetic term for phi, okay? There should be a dagger here, okay? Uh, there's an ordinary kinetic term for psi, the fermion field, and there's a mass term for F, which we still don't understand, but we'll get there. Okay? Questions? All right. Now we can do the same thing for the, uh, the, 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 this W. I, I don't think I said the words. I think it was on a slide somewhere. This W is called the superpotential. Okay? So this W for the superpotential, which is just phi cubed, in our case, for the superpotential, what do I have to do? I again have to do two derivatives. It's again the chain rule. So it looks like this. I just worked it out for a general superpotential, not for the phi cubed case. All right, but it's just the first, and deriv first derivative of W times F, second derivative times psi bar psi. So the second derivative, okay. Oh. So for our theory, I have the sum of these terms. I have kinetic terms for this guy. I put the dagger there, thank you. And uh, then I have this superpotential term here, okay? So the thing that you recognize is you recognize these kinetic terms. Those are good. And then you recognize this, this is a Yukawa coupling, right? It's a coupling of phi to two vial fermion fields. So we're starting to see, so we see some interactions. This is really great. In fact, we see ingredients that we need in the standard model, which is really great, right? What about this F? Okay, then we finally have to face the F. Well, the point is, is that this is our Lagrangian. We didn't have any choice, right? This is what supersymmetry gave us. We have to deal with what we have. What we have is a field that has a linear term and what we would normally call a mass term, right? But F has dimension two, and so this mass term is dimensionless, okay? And F is a field like every other field. We're just supposed to, if we're using a path integral quantization, for example, we're just supposed to integrate over it. Okay, there's no special rule for F. F doesn't get to be anything special. But the point is, is that the Lagrangian is quadratic in F and there are no derivatives acting on F. So F does not have any dynamics, right, in any normal sense. If I looked at the equations of motion for F, they would just be algebraic equations, okay? The fact that F is quadratic in this way means that we can integrate it out exactly in the path integral. And the point is that uh, we can write the, because f is quadratic plus linear, we can complete the square, so we can write this as uh, the square of something minus the extra term. This is completing the square, right? And now I want to claim that this term here does exactly nothing. You can just erase it, okay? And the argument is a, a simple path integral argument. The point is that if I look at the the, 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 the full path integral is the integral over all of the fields, including f. If I look at the path integral, right, once I've completed the square, the only dependence on f is in this perfect square, but I can just shift f by this amount, and then I have an integral here, which doesn't depend on any of the fields, okay? And so it just goes away. It does, it just add, it's just a constant in the path integral. It's like rescaling your path integral measure, which does nothing, okay? And so integrating out f just means we throw away the term from completing the square, but we have to remember that there was this term left over. This is the scalar potential. So this Lagrangian is a Lagrangian that you recognize, right? This is a Lagrangian of a, a, a complex scalar, a vial fermion with a Yukawa coupling and a quartic self-interaction. Okay, notice that there's only one, there are two couplings here, we would normally say, but they, this one is lambda, this one is lambda squared, the couplings are related by supersymmetry because we constructed this Lagrangian here to be invariant under supersymmetry, okay? okay. So this is just what I said, <coughs> supersymmetry relates the Yukawa coupling and the quartic scalar coupling. So if you remember back to the introduction, this is exactly what we claimed was the structure for the stop, the top, and the scalar partner of the top in, the, in a supersymmetric version of the standard model, which we need to have naturalness, okay? So we'll of course return to this subject, uh, but not, we won't get there in this lecture. Okay. Question, yeah. I'll 
Ja. Yes. Okay, good. The question is, and the previous slide when I was uh, integrating, showing how you integrate out F, okay, is this equ equivalent to imposing the equations of motion? And the answer is yes. Okay, this is precisely equivalent to using the equations of motion to eliminate F. Okay, however, you may wonder that is a sounds like a classical procedure, right? How is that justified in an interacting theory, say to all orders in perturbation theory, or perhaps even beyond perturbation theory? And that's the path integral argument that I gave. Okay, but um, I'll, I'll come back and comment on that in, in, in additionally in just a little bit. Okay. Another question? Can the supercharge be measured? That's the question. Uh, not, the answer is no, it's a fermion. It's a fermion field. So you can just as well ask, can the Dirac, can a fermion field like an electron field be measured? And the answer is no. Um, more, 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 more uh, uh, you know, to say a little more about that, you know, in, in quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory, a very important concept is the concept of an observable, right? An observable is supposed to be something that an experimentalist, at least in an ideal setting, can measure the eigenvalues of, okay? So momentum, operator, uh, in quantum mechanics, the position of a particle, and so on. These are the operators that are accessible to an experiment. Now you can just show that fermionic operators like field operators, they actually do not have eigenvalues, okay? They just do not have eigenvalues. Um, but however, squares of these things, you know, are operators that have eigenvalues. So those are well-defined operators. You can, an experimentalist could assign values to them, okay? So in the same way, uh, you know, Q is a fermionic thing, so no. Okay. So as I, as I said in the last lecture, when we, we always, of course, we're using the language of invariance when we talk about supersymmetry, but you can't picture supersymmetry as some sort of a transformation. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't measure the charge, but the mathematics of the invariance is very parallel, is exactly parallel to the invariance for things like rotations that we can picture. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so let, let's just generalize this to a general theory with n chiral superfields, okay? And uh, so we assume that the, the d4 theta term is just the sum of the phi dagger phi's. That gives us canonical kinetic terms for all of the component fields. And then we have a general superpotential, okay? And you can work out again, the, this, the generalization, the second derivative of the superpotential uh, multiplies the fermions, so this can generalize the Yukawa couplings, and then the square of the, the first derivative of the superpotential gives us the potential that we get by integrating out F. Okay? The most general renormalizable superpotential is cubic in the couplings. Okay? Now this is the question that was asked earlier. Integrating out F is precisely equivalent to imposing its equations of motion. So its operator equations of motion are simply that F is the first derivative of W. That's what the equations of motion are. So that means that the potential that I get, which is just the square of this thing, I can think of it as the square of F. Okay? All right? And that is a useful way of thinking about the potential, as we'll see. And notice that consistent with the general properties of the SUSY algebra that I talked about, this potential that we found is always positive. It's the square of something, right? It's F dagger F. So it's always positive, okay? Also remembering supersymmetry is broken if and only if the vacuum energy is positive, right? It's unbroken if the vacuum energy is zero. So from this, we see that a good order parameter for SUSY breaking, because we will eventually want to break supersymmetry, is F. F itself is a great order parameter for supersymmetry. That's one of the main reasons it's so incredibly useful. Okay? So you might not like this F because we have it and it went away. It's there to, first of all, to make supersymmetry manifest. It also gives us a very good handle on understanding how, super, what, how supersymmetry is broken. What breaks supersymmetry? What VEV? What's the Higgs? What, what, what gets an expectation value when Susie is broken? Okay? 
OK. So now uh, I'm going to explain something that's a bit technical, but I think it's very beautiful. It's also very important. And it also illustrates the power of these superfield techniques. This is the famous non-renormalization theorem uh, for n equals 1 supersymmetric theories. The point is this, is, this is really the tip of an iceberg of a vast subject. The UV divergences of a supersymmetric theory are highly constrained. Okay? Usually, what we're used to in renormalizable, in, 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 in quantum field theory, is that every term that we can write down in the Lagrangian in general has UV divergences and needs to be renormalized. In supersymmetry, we'll find that that's not the case. And I'm going to give you a complete uh, uh, modern discussion of this, which is based entirely on symmetries. You're never going to see an actual Feynman diagram, which in my view is a good thing, but you may not agree. Okay, so let's remember what the right language is. The, langu the right language is that we look at the 1PI effective action. Okay, so remember the 1PI effective action just summarizes the correlation functions of the theory, so it's a highly non local object. But the UV divergences, the UV divergent terms in the 1PI effective action are always local. That's because they come from short distances, right? If they come from short distances, they are going to be local things. That's the basic idea, OK? So that means that that already implies, this is, that already implies that the, the most general diver, uh, UV divergent terms that we have in the 1PI effective action have the same form as the Lagrangian that we started with, OK? That's the basic fundamental theorem of renormalization theory and general, non -relativist, general relativistic quantum field theory. Okay? Now let's suppose we have some UV cutoff, lambda. Then by power counting, Z is dimensionless. By the way, sorry, delta Z, just to, just to, just to there's a lot of, here. Delta Z is the coefficient of phi dagger phi, right? These other things, these deltas are the, the things that multiply the terms in the superpotential. So delta Z is dimensionless, so it can depend logarithmically on the cutoff. Kappa has dimension two, it can be quadratic, M can be linear, and little lambda can be log lambda, just by, power, by dimensional analysis. These are the most general divergences I can have, okay? Now, these UV divergent terms must respect the symmetries of the original theory, right? You're used to this, for example, in QED, you have the Ward identities that guarantee that the UV divergence structure has the same structure as the terms in the individual Lagrangian. It's they are gauge invariant. In the same way, these counterterms have to respect all of the symmetries of the theory. Okay? Now, this is true as long as we believe that this regulator doesn't break the symmetries. Okay? And in supersymmetry, we believe that, uh, that nature, for various reasons, for example, from string theory, we actually believe nature is, is supersymmetric at arbitrary short distances. So we, we better hope that we can preserve supersymmetry with some sort of regulator. And in this theory, we certainly can. We can use very specific regulators, like poly VRs or higher derivatives. So this is a bit technical, but we assume that we can keep all the symmetries of the problem. And I claim that, in this case, you really can. Okay, but then uh, you might say, well, we've already done that. We've already kept track of all the symmetries because we've required that these divergent terms are supersymmetric, okay? But it turns out there are more symmetries to be had here. And to see what these symmetries are, an extremely powerful and general tool that we use very often in particle physics, and you should learn even if you don't care about supersymmetric theories, is the idea of spurions. And the idea of spurions is that you take a coupling constant, which is a constant, which is a number. You can, experimentalist can measure it. But as a theorist, you have the freedom to promote it to a field because it appears as a symbol in your action, right? And if you put it inside the d4x integral, you can just pretend it's a field while you're doing your calculation, okay? You can always set it to the experimental value at the end when you want to tell the experimentalist what the answer is, but you keep it as a field. Now, in the case of supersymmetry, we can take our couplings kappa, m, and lambda, 
And now we can promote them not just to be fields, but to be super fields. So this is super Spurion analysis, right? And if we want this to be, but if we want this to be super symmetric, we have to promote them to chiral superfields, not just any old superfield, right? Because we want to keep them inside the d2 theta integral and we want to make them super symmetric. Okay? So let's do that. Okay? It's not obvious right now why that's a good idea, but we'll see why it's a good idea. Furthermore, once I do that, I notice that these kappas, m's, and lambdas have all these indices, right? These indices are just because I have n chiral superfields, right? But now I can imagine that there's a un symmetry that rotates these things into each other, okay? And normally you would say you can't have a un symmetry. Why? Because these kappas, m's, and lambdas break all the un symmetries in general, right? However, now that these kappas, m's, and lambdas are Spurion fields, ta-da, by magic, I just say, no, it's perfectly invariant. I just have to transform the, those guys according to their indices as well. And now, this Lagrangian is perfectly UN symmetric. Okay? All right? If it's perfectly UN symmetric, then all the UV divergences have to be UN symmetric. Right? And UN symmetry just means that I need to contract all these indices in a way to make a UN invariant. Okay? Questions on this? So this is what's used, for example, in, in, in chiral perturbation theory and in, 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 in everything, basically. Okay? So now what we see is these, these, these things, delta Z, kappa, delta kappa, delta M, delta lambda, these have to be functions of my original couplings and they have to respect this UN symmetry now, right? So what can they be, okay? Well, here's the thing, and this is now the crux of the matter. This delta lambda, delta M, and delta kappa have to be chiral superfields. That means they have to be holomorphic functions of these kappa, M's, and lambdas. They cannot depend on the daggered guys, okay? But now, there is no way to contract the indices basically, because look, right? These guys all have lower indices, right? These phi's all have upper indices, okay? So if I want to make a, a kappa out of, well, let's look at, I don't know, yeah, let's, let's, look at this, let's look at this guy, okay? So if I, if I want to make a lambda, of co delta lambda, of course it can be proportional to lambda, duh, right? But I claim there's nothing else I can write down. You might try to write down kappa times m, but that doesn't work by dimensional analysis because kappa and m have positive mass dimension. Okay? Now you might be a little bit suspicious because you might say, well, wait a minute, what if I only have one field, then I have no indices, but then I have charges. There's a U1 symmetry and you can check that the charges also don't allow you to write anything else. Okay? So this is true even for n equals one. Okay? All right? But now, all I have to do is check what, what's going on with these, with these Cs, okay? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's clear that, um, okay, so this is what I just said, okay? So because these things, delta kappa, delta, uh, delta kappa, delta m, and delta lambda, okay, the slide guy screwed up again, um, uh, uh, are linear in the couplings, I can now just compute these things in, in perturbation theory, I don't, right? And, and I can just easily see that there are no corrections, at loop, there are no loop diagrams that are, that are, um, that are, uh, that are that, that all the loop diagrams have at least two couplings in them, okay? So these Cs have to be zero. And so all of these superpotential couplings are not renormalized at all. There are no UV divergences in these guys at all. Okay? That's the argument. Questions? Okay. This was originally proved, this, this non-renormalization theorem is a classic result. It was originally proved using the full machinery of superfield perturbation theory, super diagrams and all of that. Uh, this proof was understood by Nadi Seiberg in the 90s. Okay? It's fairly recent. Now, on the other hand, the coefficient of z, 
Z was the one guy I didn't talk about. Z is a totally different beast because delta Z is a real superfield. Remember, it it's under a d4 theta integral. It multiplies phi dagger phi. It is a real superfield. And there are definitely things that I can write down there because there there's no problem in using the phi daggers. In fact, the, the leading one loop, loop result is proportional to phi dagger phi. I see that I can very well contract the indices, thank you, and I can have a log divergence. Okay? And in fact, I do as this coefficient, okay? All right. Now this, of course, uh, it can't depend on kappa or m by dimensional analysis, okay? And now we can treat this UV divergence in the standard way, okay? What is the standard way? The standard way, uh, here I'm gonna explain it in terms of a single chiral superfield to make so the notation doesn't get too, too bogged down, okay? So I have a single chiral superfield. Now what I do is uh, I add a counter, I have, a, a, I add a counter term to the Lagrangian that cancels the dependence on lambda, the UV cutoff, but it introduces uh, dependence on a renormalization scale mu, okay? The, the renormalized Lagrangian is defined by sort of taking out the counter term. That has now a wave function coefficient z that depends on mu in the way I've done things, okay? Now usually what you do in, and, and this, this z of mu satisfies this renormalization group equation where the z here is, the cz is just that constant that came from the one loop calculation, right? It's minus one over four pi squared, okay? Now this is not normally the way that you do perturbation theory. Normally you set the coefficient of the kinetic term to one at each scale, okay? So we would like to define a new field phi hat by just scaling out this wave function renormalization. Now one thing to note here is that this step, we can no longer treat z as a superfield anymore, right? But that's okay, we know we have to set it to be a number eventually, so now is the time to do that, okay? And so now we have to, z is back to being an ordinary number, and it's just equal to this, and now we have a, uh, we have a canonical kinetic term, but now we have to redefine the superfield couplings, okay? They've been rescaled by these z's, and so what we find is that they, in fact, the, 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 if we canonically normalize the kinetic term, the physically normalized uh, couplings do have non-trivial logarithmic renormalization, but only logarithmic, right? And they're, in fact, given by the same function cz, right? They're all determined by wave function renormalization. Okay, so this is, this is the general structure of renormalization in these, in these theories, right? In theories of chiral supermultiplets. Okay. So one implication of this that's often used in model building is that if we, no matter if there's a symmetry or not, if we set some superfield coupling to zero, it stays zero to all orders in perturbation theory because it's just purely multiplicatively renormalized. Okay, questions? Yes. The question is, what if the background symmetries are anomalous? That's a beautiful question, okay? In the West Semino model that I'm looking at, there are no gauge fields, and so there are no anomalies in that case, okay? So in this case, it's totally legit. When there are gauge theories, there are interesting anomalies. They do have very interesting effects. I don't have time to talk about them. Um, uh, I can give you references for that, okay? But yes, there, there are very interesting effects that precisely arise from the anomalies in symmetries like this UN when I have gauge fields present, which I haven't talked about yet. Other questions? Okay, so gauge theories. You asked for gauge theories. We want gauge theories, right? This is all great. We certainly like, to, like scalars and uh, fermions, but we also need gauge fields. So we need to understand how to formulate gauge fields in superspace. And it should not come as a shock that the guiding principle is going to be gauge invariance, right? That's how we construct gauge theories uh, as field theories. So now we have to have gauge invariance in superspace. So we'll consider the case of a U1 gauge group. So if I have a, 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 a complex scalar and a vial fermion uh, and I want them to be charged under a U1 gauge group, 
I, should, I need to give them the same charge since they're in the same supermultiplet. I give them some charge Q, okay? And uh, I, want to, I want to write down a Lagrangian that's invariant under this, okay? But these guys are contained in a chiral superfield, capital Phi, and I need some kind of, the, the, the transformation parameter theta, which I'm sorry, has nothing to do with the other thetas, but that's life. Uh, uh, this thing is a function of x, right? That's the whole point of gauge invariance is the transformation parameters are functions of x. But now I need the transformation parameter to itself be a superfield, right? In order to preserve, in order that this thing here be a superfield, i.e. transforms like a superfield under supersymmetry. And it has to be a chiral superfield, okay? So suddenly the gauge invariance has been blown up to a huge gauge invariance that depends on an entire chiral superfield, okay? Just, now we're really just following the script of ordinary gauge theory. In ordinary gauge theory, we say, okay, great, we want invariance under this, and then we discover that the kinetic term is not invariant under gauge transformation, and that will lead us to introduce a gauge field. We do exactly the same thing here. Here's the kinetic term. Here's how it transforms under gauge transformations. Okay, it is not invariant. Why? Because omega is a full chiral superfield. It's a complex object. Okay, I cannot impose phi dagger equals minus phi without violating supersymmetry. And so this thing is, the kinetic term is not invariant. Okay, now the way that I make it invariant is actually the stupidest possible way you could imagine turns out to work, which is that I introduce a real superfield V that just shifts under this, this uh, omega combination omega plus omega dagger, okay? And I get this. This is, sorry, this thing is gauge invariant. I've just defined V to shift oppositely to cancel this factor, that's all, okay? That seems really dumb, like the sort of thing that would never actually work, but it turns out that it works. Okay? So just as with ordinary gauge theories, we had to introduce some new degrees of freedom to make the kinetic term gauge invariant. And now we need to define the components of this thing V. What are the components? Okay? Well, here they are in all of their glory. There's a com lowest component, a fermion, two, th two theta derivatives, a theta and a theta bar derivatives, three guys, four guys. Okay? and there's some factors and some eyes, and they're there to basically make everything real. Okay? Okay? And I need to tell you what the components of omega are. Omega is this chiral superfield, which is now my transformation parameter. And that has a complex, that's a complex thing. It has as its lowest component. I've written it like this because here, theta is the theta of x, the the gauge transformation parameter, I really should call that something else. I'll call it something else. I'll call it alpha in my, when I fix the, the notes, okay? So anyway, this thing right here is the, uh, is the gauge transformation parameter, the ordinary one, as we'll, uh, well, no, not as we'll see, as we, as we know. And then we have a fermion, and then we have this E, which is like the, 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 like the auxiliary field of, of omega, okay? And now I can just work out what the gauge transformations are of all of these components, okay? And uh, it's, again, the same kind of algebra over and over again that I keep doing. So the lowest component of the gauge field just shifts by omega. The fermion shifts by eta, which was the next component of the gauge field. The A mu transforms, that's good. That's really good, right? because we see that this A mu transforms the way a gauge field should, okay? So just by following our nose, we found that one component of this V does transform like a gauge field. Now we know we're on the road to success, right? Okay, and then lambda doesn't shift at all. It's invariant, and D doesn't shift, okay? All right. This is, I'm not going to go over this, but there's some uh, uh, help for you if you want to, people who want to compute the, uh, the algebra. So here I've just summarized it. So what happens is that the lowest components of the vector superfield C, chi, and B, they just shift. They're just pure shifts, okay? And then A has an interesting transformation. It transforms like a gauge transformation. The other guys are invariant. 
That's the result. Okay. So now notice that because these lowest fields here, they just shift by some, remember these uh, omegas, etas, and e's are just general functions of x. So we can just set these fields to zero by using, the, using up this gauge freedom. That still leaves the gauge freedom in theta, which I'll rename alpha, I promise, okay? Okay, and this gauge choice is called West's amino gauge. So in that gauge, things simplify a lot because the lowest components of V are all zero, okay? And now I can just work out, using the same kinds of Susie algebra that I did before, I can work out what the gauge invariant kinetic term is. And guess what? Okay, I get, of course, covariant derivatives of the scalar, covariant derivatives of the fermion. I still have my F dagger F. There are no derivatives, no need for conformal, uh, for for covariant derivatives. So all of this structure is just dictated by gauge invariance. It couldn't be anything else, right? Because the, the A mu transforms as a gauge field, okay? The only thing that is, uh, that is not dictated by ordinary gauge invariance is this term right here. There's a term phi dagger phi D. We can understand where that comes from because D is the highest component of V. That's a theta squared, theta bar squared term. And so we have a term like this. Okay, questions? Okay. All right, so we see in fact this silly idea of just putting in this V really does work. It makes the kinetic term gauge invariant in just the way that it should, okay? Now we also have to write a gauge kinetic term, right? We have to write not only the kinetic term for the scalars but also the gauge uh, kinetic term, okay? And we can take a page out of, if we go back and look at how we define the components, the uh, fermion lambda, okay, the fermion component lambda was defined by taking three derivatives of V in this way and then taking the lowest component. And we found that that was gauge invariant. It turns out that it's also gauge invariant if you don't take the lowest component. Okay, so exactly the, we're following our nose, I just want to give the, the idea that what we're doing here, it, it, it's somewhat formal, but once you have a few basic ideas, it really is just following your nose. Um, anyway, this thing right here, this combination is gauge invariant. Okay, so this is a superfield that is gauge invariant. It's also a chiral superfield. You can see that d bar acting on it is zero because if I take d bar and act on this, I have three d bars right in a row, which is zero because all the d's anti-commute, okay? And so it is a chiral superfield. It has nothing to do with the superpotential, which is also called w. That's a standard, these are very standard notations, so I'm not changing this one, I'm sorry, okay? Um, and uh, now that allows us to write and, and this thing has dimension three halves. If you work out the dimension here, V was dimension less. Remember, it went up into the Lagrangian, so up into the, the exponential, so it's dimension less. And then uh, I, I work out what this thing is. What is D2 theta? And I get, guess what? I get a gauge kinetic term. I get I times FF dual, and I get a kinetic term for lambda, and I get a D squared. So if I want to give a complex coefficient, there's no reason why this coefficient in the d squared theta integral cannot be complex. And if I give it this complex coefficient, I work it out, I get a kinetic term, okay? I get a theta term, I get a, a kinetic term for, the, for, for lambda, and I get this d squared term. So you can see now this d is a real scalar field it's going to be something like an auxiliary field, kind of like F, except this guy is real, okay? And I have these funny one over Gs because I put a one over G here, okay? But, so these one over Gs are not the way that you're probably used to seeing the gauge theory written, but I can rescale V goes to GV. That means I rescale all the component fields by a factor of G, and then this thing looks more familiar. Okay, so this is, it's actually a useful thing to go back and forth between these two 
de definitions, one where there's a one over G squared in front of the kinetic term and, the, and no G in the covariant derivative. And then if you rescale, you have a G in the covariant derivative but no G in the kinetic term. And it's useful to go back and forth between those, okay? So let's see, I want to sort of wrap up. Let me see, yeah, this is a good place to wrap up, okay? So uh, now I've, I've, I've kind of made a little bit of a thing about this theta angle. In a U1 gauge field, the theta term is, uh, doesn't do anything. It's a total derivative uh, in, in any gauge theory, but in an abelian gauge theory, it actually doesn't do anything. In a non-abelian gauge theory, it does something. Uh, so I'm just trying to, illustri just trying to illustrate that you that a theta term is completely compatible with supersymmetry. But in this theory here, we could have just left it off, okay? And uh, the, uh, as I said, there's this D term here, which is gonna be an auxiliary field, very much like F. It can be integrated out using its equation of motion. Uh, we'll talk about that next time, okay? So I'm gonna stop here. I think I have, is that right? I have a, a 15 minutes for questions? Yeah, I just wanna make sure, yeah. So I'll stop here, and then I'll just take some questions. Okay, so let's start with questions. I, I'm not taking this as a good sign. Can you say something about this lambda field? This is uh, something like a ghost? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. No, no, it's not a ghost at all, sorry. So, um, so uh, remember that all of these fields are just following my nose. All these fields are fields that are in the path integral. I have to integrate over them. This is a field, sorry, this is a, a, a fermion field with a good well-to-do ordinary kinetic term, okay? So this is a physical fermion. It is exactly the superpartner of the gauge field. Remember at the beginning of the lecture, I said that the one particle, rep the massless one particle representations of the supersymmetry algebra included one, uh, one with a massless spin one particle plus a massless spin one half particle. That's exactly what I have here. I have a massless spin one particle and plus a massless spin one half particle. This is beautiful. This is just like in the scalar case, I had a single, uh, uh, a, a, a single complex scalar and a single vial fermion. Here I have a, 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 a vector, a massless spin one and a massless spin one half, okay? So uh, this is a gauge boson. This one is typically called the gauge eno. So when we want, if we want to have Bose-Fermi symmetry, we need to have one fermion for every boson and vice versa. And so we should expect we should have, we, we, we knew, we, if we thought about it ahead of time, we would know we have to get a fermion. And we do. You computed this WW term there, and then you multiply it with a complex number. Yes. And I don't get why this vacuum angle appears only in the F, F tilde term. So not that in goes, the other terms. Yeah, so I mean, of course... They must be canceled out somewhere. Sorry? They must, be, they must be canceled out somewhere. What must be canceled out somewhere? That these vacuum angle terms in this normal F, F term and in this D square term. Is your question, how, did, how does this lead to that? Yeah. yeah. Is that your question? So I'm not going to... I mean, th th there's a detailed calculation to be done, but it, it basically comes from this. Okay, so when you do this calculation without any Hermitian conjugate or prefactor or anything, if you just do this calculation, you find that there's a, this, this is a complex quantity, okay? And it, uh, it comes, it has, its lowest component has a real part, which is F squared, and an imaginary part, which is FF dual. So you really, once you accept this, then the, the, the other thing follows, okay? Because if I have multiply two complex numbers together, the real part is this real times real minus imaginary times imaginary, that's all. So it comes back to the fact that this is a complex number. 
that, I'm that I define the kinetic term not as you might expect as the square of something, which is manifestly real, but as a holomorphic plus anti-holomorphic thing. Does that answer your question? You don't look that way. But why don't we, we can, I, can, I, can try, I can try again after the lecture. But I certainly didn't explain where this comes from. So if that's your question, it's, it's a bunch of algebra. This is okay, but then look, look, I have I times the imaginary part of this, I have real times the real part of this. Because I have this Hermitian conjugate. Okay, yeah. All right. So can you also build a spin to um, supermultiplet and somehow play with the transformations and get rid of a couple of the uh, components? Yes, so spin two multiplets are of course of great interest. Uh, the massless spin two field is the graviton. So your question is exactly equivalent to saying, can I construct a supersymmetric theory of gravity? Okay, um, and the answer is yes with a lot, lot, lot more work. Okay, gravity is always more complicated than ordinary field theory and you have to, because you have to, we, in the end you know you have to gauge Lorentz transformations essentially when you just construct ordinary gravity. To construct a supersymmetric gravity you have to, you have to gauge supersymmetry and that is, uh, that's, that, that can be pretty complicated. Um, one comment I do want to add is that it's complicated, but we have to do it. If we believe that supersymmetry is a fundamental symmetry, as I keep saying, it's a space-time symmetry. And we know that the space-time symmetry is gauged because we know general relativity exists. So we actually know that supergravity must exist. It even has phenomenological consequences. Uh, it's one of the topics I'm not going to be able to cover in, in this course. Um, could you go back to the Spurion slide where you first uh, promoted the parameters to fields? Yeah, next. Sure. Yes, so uh, uh, I, I wanted to, to understand the logic. So in the beginning you have a Lagrangian which does not have this UN symmetry. Here's the, here's the Lagrangian. I mean, there are the kinetic terms. The kinetic terms, the kinetic terms are invariant under the U1, right? Because the kinetic terms just look like phi dagger A, phi A, right? So the kinetic terms are invariant under the UN, UN, right? The interaction terms are not because the couplings carry UN indices and they are numbers, right? If this described the real world, the particle data book would tell you the value of kappa one, kappa two, kappa three, and so on, right? So b before you promote them to fields, there is no UN symmetry, no only UN afterwards. Symmetry. So, uh, but I can write it like this. this yes. is my, and once I write it like this, if I as a theorist, right, imagine a universe where these are just fields, where kappa, m, and lambda are fields, I can say, well, gee, look, they transform under a UN symmetry. And then you renormalize the field values, correctly? Instead of renormalizing the couplings, you renormalize the fields lambda of x, essentially. That's right. The way I can think about it is if these were actually dynamical fields, you would be say, well, if they're dynamical fields, you, you're, I, you, you have to put a coupling constant in front of these fields, right? However, if you do that, I can say, well, nee on you, because I'm just going to absorb that coupling into the fields. But you also need to add a kinetic term for all those fields yes, or not. Yes, if they had kinetic terms, I would now, exactly, if they had kinetic terms, I would now have get some non-trivial factor in front of the kinetic terms of those fields. But I never have to look at those kinetic terms, so I'm fine with those ugly factors being there. So I can really think of this as just some fields coupled, some new fields, kappa, m, and lambda, coupled to these old fields. And if you like, I'm just keeping their VEVs, okay? In fact, this is how we, if this is exactly what we do in the standard model. For, for much of the standard model, until the Higgs was discovered in 2012, the, the only appearance of the Higgs in the Lagrangian that was tested was in terms of its VEV, right? You could take the standard model Lagrangian, replace the Higgs everywhere by its VEV, and for all intents and purposes, that was the Lagrangian, right? 
That was the Lagrangian for every process that doesn't involve actually creating a Higgs boson. So in exactly the same way, if you think of these as fields, as long as I never look at processes where I'm creating these fields, if they in fact are fields, okay, I don't know what mass I'm supposed to give them, right? But if I just look at processes where I don't create those fields and they just, I think of them as all just having VEBs, that's exactly the Lagrangian that I have. So just as the standard model is not the, the standard model with Higgs VEBs put everywhere, you could possibly imagine putting a number V, uh, they're put in in a very correlated way. Because why? Because the Higgs is a doublet under electroweak symmetry, right? Here it's the same kind of idea. These kappas, m's, and lambdas don't appear in a completely arbitrary way. They appear in a way that is dictated by this UN symmetry. So I don't know if that helps. Um, I know that there is these um, um, description of BRST symmetry in terms of superspace. Yes. How, do, how is this connected to this description of the gauge field? Does this depend on the gauge you choose? Well, it's very important, first of all, that uh, this supersymmetry is conceptually completely different from BRS symmetry. Okay, So coming back to, because um, I sort of suspect that this problem, uh, I, I sort of suspect this, prob this, 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 this connection can arise most easily in your mind in gauge theories. So let's talk about gauge theories. Now this, this Lagrangian here is invariant under these supersymmetries, okay? Now that is a real symmetry that enforces, uh, inf it, 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 it relates the properties of this physical spin one half field to the properties of this spin one field. It's a physical symmetry that relates different things. BRS symmetry is instead is a principle that we can use to understand the correct counting of degrees of freedom in a gauge theory. So physically, conceptually, they are completely different things, okay? Um, formally, they have a lot of the same properties because they're both fermionic symmetries. So the mathematics gets recycled, okay? But physically, they are completely different things. Other questions? Here? Giovanni, this. Thank you. Is there any advantage of the other gauge than the best middle gauge? Um, yes, actually there is. <laughs> um, you know, uh, 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 just as in gauge theories, one gauge is enough. Right? I mean, it doesn't matter what gauge you use, so there's never anything wrong with West Amino gauge, but sometimes certain properties are more obvious in some gauges than others. Um, it turns out that one that I can think of, there's probably more, but one that I can think of is just like, there, there's, remember there's the spurious UN symmetry? It turns out it's also a very useful idea to gauge that symmetry. Okay, so you introduce some fictitious background gauge fields. That's also always a good idea. If you have a global symmetry in your theory, no matter what quantum field theory you have, gauge it and you will probably learn something, okay? Um, and it turns out that the lowest components of these things make, it, make certain things manifest, like for example, the structure of a vacua and other, other things. So the quick answer is yes, but certainly for doing practical calculations in particle physics, I think you should always use West Amino gauge. Okay. I think people should be allowed to go to lunch, maybe. <laughs> okay. okay, so let's go to lunch and thank the speaker again. <laughs>